GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. Don't get caught in the hype cycle. I'm Jay Bird, and I believe that music is changing our world. And that's why I'm carving a path for doers to confidently build and invest in Web3. Why? Because Web3 is going to change the music world. It is going to specifically change music for artists. I think we all know that there is a massive problem with our ability to compensate musicians and artists in the current model of the way that we access their art. It is particularly pronounced in music, where as a result of streaming services, there is a very, very difficult time for artists to make a living wage, a living income off of their music. In today's episode, I have Nigel, the co-founder of Vault with us to break down the $10 billion music industry problem and how Web3 is going to solve it. Now, Nigel is a, a real, real expert in creating businesses. And I'll tell you why, because he previously was a co-founder and CEO of FanDuel, which is the largest sports betting platform in the US with over $3 billion in revenue last year and 50% of the US market in sports betting. So Nigel's been around the block. He's seen success. He's built up a billion dollar company and now he has decided to dedicate his time to Web3. Why? Well, because he believes in music and he believes that Web3 offers a better way for a couple things. One, for musicians to monetize and make money because currently in streaming, and Nigel gives us some breakdown, that if you get a million streams on a song on Spotify, you make $3,500. And just to put that into perspective, a million streams is it very difficult to achieve that level? Not many artists are achieving that. And only $3,500, you can't live off $3,500. So that's a problem. The other problem is that fans don't have a direct way to support artists. If you're a fan of a musician that you love, you want to support them, you want to have a way to support them. Currently, the only way you can support them, you can go to their live shows, you can buy their merch, or you can buy their vinyl records. We've gone backwards and we're selling vinyl records again because musicians know that's one of the, right now, one of the only ways they can monetize. And if you look at Taylor Swift, who is really one of the most innovative musicians in the world, she is very successful with vinyl records. And Nidal's is going to tell us about that in today's episode. Folks, this is one of my favorite episodes that we have recorded in a while. Highly recommend this one. You're really going to enjoy learning from Nigel on his path as an entrepreneur and building a billion dollar company, and then his path in entering Web3 and trying to solve the problems that the music industry faces and how he is doing that with Vault. So let's jump in. Before we do, we'll just take a minute to hear from our sponsors. The future of social media is here, and that future lives in Web3 on top of Lens Protocol. Web2 social platforms are broken and ripe for disruption. You see, the epicenter of social media is the creators, and yet they are the most neglected. Web2 platforms like Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram are all essentially robbing creators of their worth. Creators are a new type of entrepreneur, forming new types of businesses. Yet with Web2 platforms, creators don't own their content or their profiles, and that's their product and business. Instead, they are tied to the platforms they choose to create on. Well, just like how crypto is freeing us from banks, Web3 is freeing us from these centralized platforms. On Lens Protocol, creators own their content, own their profile, and even their social graph and followers in the form of NFTs. This allows you to move freely from one social application to another with your content, profile, and followers moving along with you. Lens Protocol enables self-sovereignty for your social graph and interoperability across the internet. At Web3 Academy, we believe this is the future of social, and that's why we've partnered with Lens to ensure that the path of social media is heading in the right direction. Visit lens.xyz to learn more today. 
What's up, y'all doers? We're seeing signs on chain of the very early stages of a crypto bull run. There's a big wave coming and we want to make sure you're on it. Now's the time to capitalize on the opportunity. How you ask? By starting to practice consistent dollar cost average buys into strong network-based assets like Ethereum and Bitcoin. However, when buying, please make sure to use a trusted exchange. Our newest sponsor, Buy DeFi, is a reliable exchange that offers you a platform to turn your fiat into crypto. They also offer awesome rewards, allowing you to earn up to $2,800 for completing easy tasks like setting up two-factor authentication and verifying your identity. If you're eager to get into the market, get started with Buy DeFi now by visiting buydefi.com. That's B-Y-D-F-I.com or clicking the link in the description below. Nigel, welcome to the show. So happy to have you here. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Let's start from, I actually don't know if this is the beginning of your career with FanDuel, but it's certainly the highlight of your career, I'm sure. Yeah. Let's start at FanDuel. I know FanDuel is not a Web3 company. It's mm -hmm. a sports gambling company, one of the largest in the US, 50% of the US market share, 3 billion in revenue last year. But tell us a little bit about your background, how you came into founding FanDuel, some highlights from that experience and that journey. Yeah, so FanDuel, very unlikely story, started by five co-founders. We were all based in Edinburgh. None of us were American. Never mind, none of us followed American sports. I previously had been in the, the sports betting industry in the UK. And in 2007, we actually went to launch a prediction market, a prediction market called HubDub. And this is like pre-financial crisis. And it was sort of play money. It was a lot of fun. We did a lot of election markets, but it didn't have a very strong business model. And then in 2009, we sort of said, hey, we've got a really good team here. We're good at building games, prediction games. What can we do? And we saw that sports was our most active category, even though we hadn't really paid attention to it. And we saw that fantasy sports was a pretty big market. And we said, well, why don't we build a better version of fantasy sports? And that was the start. And FanDuel itself, uh, it was a fifteen dollar domain that we bought, you know, off GoDaddy in two thousand nine. So it's pretty impressive for what's now like a twenty two billion dollar company. You weren't even a fantasy sports. No, I never played fantasy like, sports in my life. Really? Yeah, that's so interesting. Our, usually, usually yeah. founders are the more, like they're actively involved in. Yeah, and then they, they see they, a problem, they experience it themselves, and then right, they, they solve the problem. That's, that's definitely a sort of a trope of entrepreneurship. I actually think, you know, there was a lot of people come innovating within fantasy sports and it was interesting they all came out of a different direction which is they always had this even more complicated game that mm -hmm. you know you, traditionally people played in yahoo and espn mm -hmm. and they're like i've got an even better game because it's like so many points per touchdown unless this happens and then this happens and then i'm like and here's me i've never played before in my life it's already too complicated for me to understand mm -hmm. and so we ended up designing a game that was so simple that even I could understand it, given that I hadn't been brought up in it. And that actually turned out to be like a winning formula because we actually made a very simple game. You know, we made something mm -hmm. that could be really mass market. Prior to FanDuel, fantasy sports only grew virally because you needed to have a friend to explain it to you how it worked. Mm -hmm. Whereas with FanDuel, people could just download an app and go, oh, right, I just picked like nine players and I just put $5 by them and hit go and then I can watch them play. That's not so hard. We kind of turned our handicap there into like a huge advantage. It's just we designed something that in the end was actually really simple. It could go mass market. It makes me think of one of my favorite quotes, Steve Jobs, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's definitely true. And that was a core factor in the success of like what FanDuel came today, which was it became a very simple product that people could pick up and play. The other thing that makes me think of is right now in the Web3 space, mm -hmm. we see <laughs> we see this complexity the all of the time. Like, yeah. yeah, like earlier today, we recorded our weekly news roll up. It's Thursday. If you guys are listening to this, you're hearing this about six days after we're recording mm -hmm. this episode. And we talked about um, OP Pen. It's Jack mm -hmm. Butcher's project. I don't know if you know it. I'm in Web3. And I can't yeah. fucking understand that problem. Yeah. Like it is very difficult. To, and then I yeah. and then I'm diving into Yuga Labs and looking yeah. at like Dookie Dash and then Heavy Metal and their games. These are very complex, yes. challenging things to understand. What do you think about that being the current state of the Web three oh, space? Yeah. It's a huge issue. As if 
Web3 is a magnet for complexity. And, and some of that complexity, I think, is obfuscation from the fact that it's, you know, shall we say it, a Ponzi scheme, right? If we just sort of set up front what it was, then I think nobody would get involved. And so, you know, and we saw like the purest form of it, which in 2021, which is like Olympus die, which was just so complicated. And at the end, it really was just a Ponzi scheme. People would probably criticize that description of it. But essentially it was like the only way it would go up is if people kept buying in. But it was so complicated. I remember watching like YouTube videos and, and obviously the only YouTube videos were people who were like really thought it was the, the reinvention of money. And then you, it's sort of the end of it. You go, I still don't really get it. Like, and I think in Web3, I usually like, I always, my first reaction is like, why don't I get it? Am I stupid? And I'd say 90% of the time it's because they don't make sense, right? 10% of the time you're like, wow, that's, I get it. Now I understand it. Like, I remember the first time I understood how an AMM works, like on a Uniswap and you can be a liquidity mm -hmm. provider. And I was like, I, for a long time, I was like, I just don't understand that. Once I understood it, I was like, wow, that's, that's genius. But that's like the one instance. There's other one instances, but there's so many times where like I look into a project and I'm like, at its core, there's really not much there. It's like, you know, if they took away the complexity and that definitely harms it. If you really want a vision of getting to millions of consumers, that complexity is not going to get us from where we are here to where we want to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a great point. I always wonder, part of it is when we have new tech and when we have new foundational layers of tech, which mm -hmm. quite honestly... Most people are never going to use the term NFT. They're not even going to know that they're buying an NFT. Yeah. You were telling me about that right before we hit yeah. the court. And I hear that all the time. We need people to experiment. And so we yeah. do need this like very, you know, nerdy, confusing, let's go experiment and try things. Right. But then at the same time, we also need the mass market. It sort of makes me think of like Yuga Labs versus V Friends and Gary V. If you look at like V Friends and what Gary V is doing, and I'm actually writing a deep dive right now on Burn Island, which is his like, it's basically sweepstakes, right? Mm -hmm. It's very simple. You mm -hmm. can burn a token and you might mm -hmm. win something. No yeah. complexity, right? Gary V, he understands the mass market, that's mm -hmm. the mindset, right? But then you look at like Yuga Labs and they clearly have the mindset of let's be more, a little bit more degen. Let's be a little mm -hmm. more exclusive. Let's not be for everybody. Mm -hmm. A reason I bring this up and feel free to add any thoughts mm -hmm. you have, but I'm curious if you have from your experience of building mm -hmm. FanDuel and taking that from zero $15 domain to a billion dollar yeah. company, what were the big lessons or the things that you took away that you would share with founders, regardless of whether it's web three or whatever business? But like to like use a like different analogy, and I'll touch on FanDuel in a moment. I think of uh, we talked about this before. If we think about Web three and compare it with like the automobile revolution, which I think is really an interesting one. So late nineteen hundreds, early twentieth century, we had these people who tinkered around with this internal combustion engine, and then they put it on, I guess, a cart, <laughs> and they showed that they could get it to move slowly mm -hmm. and dangerously, and sometimes it blew up. It was really a hobbyist industry, and it was a, an elite that did it because it was very expensive and it was very unreliable. Web3 is like that today. It is full of hobbyists. And I think that's great and we need that. And you have to be a hobbyist. You have to understand then you had to be a mechanic or you had to employ a mechanic to operate one of these newfangled machines. But that's kind of where we're at where, with Web3, which is people are either mechanics or they employ a mechanic. However, automobiles only ever became a mass market phenomena whenever non-mechanics could happily get into one and get the benefit, which is to go from A to B quickly and relatively safely and smoothly and fast, that is what it turned it from being a, like a tinkerer's, like a hobbyist activity into something that actually became a mass market phenomena. And I think that's true what we see with Web3 is we still, a lot of the infrastructure, for example, wallets, does it look almost identical to click a transaction that is sign that I'm here, the transaction where it is drain my wallet <laughs> yeah. This is my entire bank account. <laughs> Why do they look almost the same? Why is it indistinguishable to a normal person? A developers will say, well, if you investigate the code. That's what they always say. I go, you investigate the code. <laughs> right. Which even as we've seen, even sophisticated people in Web3 do not do. We are at this very, very primitive stage. We need to get to, if we genuinely want millions of people to use this technology, we need to be able to provide the benefits 
without expecting them to be a car mechanic. And that's what we're expecting today, where I said, oh, you have to learn about seed phrases and self-custody and you have to you know, inspect the code. That's not happening. This is never going to happen. And it's never happened really with any interesting technology that's gone mainstream. What's happened is technologists have managed to deliver the benefit without expecting the user to really get into the balls of the system. <laughs> Earlier today, I was explaining ERC 6551 to somebody. And even just saying that, like, <laughs> you don't want a mainstream user to have to understand. Yeah. We're going to talk about music and your new project soon, but we're having so much fun just chewing the shit early here. So we'll keep going for a bit. But on the music side, I think everyone understands MP3 to a certain mm -hmm. degree. They've at least yeah. you know heard it. But the analogy I always make is I don't go around telling everybody I bought a bunch of MP3s. I'm signed up for a streaming service that gives me yeah. access to MP3s. So the same yeah. thing, you're not going to go around telling people you bought a bunch of NFTs or you bought yeah. a bunch of ERC-721s. Nobody needs to know yeah. that, right? So if I, I'll even go further than that. MP3 is an amazing technology. There's actually a whole book you can read about how they managed to compress a massive sound file into this you know, tiny thing. That's what kind of gave rise to this revolution. No one even knows about it because all they right. knew was that music, which, you know, was physical and was cumbersome, now could be shrunk down and, and to just a, like a little audio file that they could basically download from a website. That was revolutionary. It wasn't the technology. It was what it let that user do that mattered. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. FanDuel, any lessons you want to share from there? I think a number of things that we found with FanDuel, like certainly one, which is the need for simplicity. We prided ourselves in building a, a lightweight product that users loved, right? And we focused a lot on that first-time user experience. Like, how does the user go from seeing an ad to hitting a landing page to playing for the first time? We really valued the user experience above and beyond whether or not they won. In fact, we had really nearly, for instance, the start, we actually had a deposit bonus which basically said, if you lose your first game and don't enjoy it, email us and we'll give you your money back. Because we just oh. felt that, look, if you play it and you didn't like it, we don't really want to hold on to you as a customer because that's not what about it. It should be like a really fun experience. And I think that sort of held us to a high standard. Like if we delivered a crappy experience, everybody would ask for their money back. The good news is the product experience was great. And so generally very few people did. So I think simplicity is really important. I think quality of experience is, is really, really important. I'd say another one, and I think this is really important in Web3, is there's a very interesting relationship with money. And that money, even a product like FanDuel, which is a gaming product where you think, oh, well, people play it to win money. That's actually not why they play it. It's actually not at all why they play it. The reason they play it is FanDuel skews at young and male competitive, unsurprisingly, like crypto. The reason they play it is really around status and success and feeling a sense of control. They want to be seen as their, by their peers as successful. They also, like a big part of it is, and that's for sort of high value players, another big part of it is just pure entertainment. This is when I see this like play to earn. I'm like, this is like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Play by its very nature is about entertainment. And if you're having to pay me to play it, the game sucks. Like, I don't care. The game <laughs> sucks. And so they, from the very start of this sort of play, and, and the only reason you're paying them is is because of that. Vandal never paid people to play. They played because they loved it, and it was a fun game, and we delivered something that nothing else could deliver. And so I think that anyone developing in Web3, I think there's a real danger, just runs on to another point, which is tokens themselves are very dangerous in that they can give you a sense you have product market fit when mm. you don't, because you're just paying people to use a product. And that is very dangerous. You think it's great because you see all this traction, but there will come a point where you no longer can pay them. And if your product is not great, your traction is going to go to zero. That's highly problematic. I love that line. I want to quote that. We're definitely going to make that an outtake in this episode. <laughs> that was a great line. Okay. How does a guy go from founding a billion dollar sports betting company to transitioning into web three. What was the moment? Who was the person? How did that go? 
Yeah, well, so I've left the sports betting industry twice. I was actually involved in Betfair and, and Flutter in 2000, got out of that, got back into it again with FanDuel, got out of it again. I played around with crypto in 2017. I read the Bitcoin white paper. I read uh, Ethereum white paper and it was like, wow, this is Bitcoin didn't really interest me. Yeah. I didn't really have much money then. So I was like, oh, great. Another way to store the money I don't have. I wasn't that excited about it, it being a speculative asset. Because in a way, speculative assets don't really interest me intrinsically. They kind of interest me. I always prefer more money to less money, but I just didn't find them intellectually interesting. Ethereum, though, I found fascinating. It's like the idea that I could build this or we could build on top of this decentralized world computer. And I sort of visualized all of the possible consumer applications I could build on it. And I remember getting into it in 2017 and then starting to realize that the core infrastructure there was so basic that you know the biggest consumer application in 2017 was CryptoKitties, which was almost impossible to buy, right? So I was like, wow, this is never... Like I, I, at that point, I was like, this is years away from being a consumer product. And the only thing that got me back was in 2020, there was actually Top Shot on Nifty Gateway. And actually, in the meantime, I'd set up a, a sports trading card business and when I saw Top Shot, I was like, wow, this is cool. I get this. It was consumer friendly. You could buy with a credit card. I'm like, you know, and that acted as an onboarding. And so I started collecting on there and I still have that collection. And I was actually <laughs> looking at Nifty, Nifty Gateway one today. And I did make the mistake of checking what the lo- recent trades were. And it looks like they're the same price because nobody's selling them. So obviously. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I found that as a route back in again, and I thought NFTs were brilliant. Like giving ownership of a digital asset, I think is a really magical property. And I think that's why we saw a huge explosion in 21, where people sort of said, we have this magical property that can't be done anywhere. Where could we apply it? And we saw mm. a lot of places where it made a lot of sense. And I would say one, one place, which was in the fine art market, some places where it maybe made sense, which is like the idea of recreating clubs and virtual clubs right. communities no i mostly make it sense and then some areas where it like makes absolutely no sense at all like nft mortgages or you know sort of like mirroring with physical assets where you actually had to rely on law to back it up till you get to the point mm-hmm. well why am i using a blockchain anyhow th- those are the places where it just didn't make any sense and, and we saw a lot of that in its essence ownership of a digital asset is a magical property yeah I completely agree. And you got to use it to get that feeling. There is something so powerful. Remember my first NFT I bought, it was $20. It was for my wife for her birthday and it was a llama. Like (laughs) it's probably worth less than zero now because there's no liquidity in this case. I couldn't sell it to anybody. But there was something really powerful about Mm -hmm. this concept of I own this. You just don't know until you try it and you get Mm -hmm. there. So, okay. So for you then, did you see Web3 and say, I want to start a Web3 company and then go figure out the consumer application that was in? Uh, How did that happen? So what happened was in 2020, I started playing around with crypto and I started to sort of say, well, this is actually a really cool technology. It was sort of early 21 that we started as a company to say, well, so we had already started a company, which was a, a chat product, somewhat like Discord. And we discovered is that social is actually one of the hardest verticals to build any product in. There's like a very, very small number of winners. So we had built this chat product. And then one of the things we built into it was this idea of buying something, which was an NFT that unlocked content. And that became the sort of starting point of like, oh, this unlockable content is really interesting. Like, and we started to think about what that meant. And we started to think, well, in the offline world, if you remember back to early NFTs, even today, you'll have the sort of the right click brigade who are like, I can right click save. And yeah, we sort of laughed at them, but they had an element of truth, right? Like it was true. Like everything apart from the price appreciation, which none of us have seen, the theoretical price appreciation, that person who right clicked it has the same rights as everyone else. Like they get to experience it, enjoy it. And so we sort of thought, you know, that's not true in the offline world. Like I don't go into a record shop and I can't play all that music whether I buy it or not. And we sort of said, well, maybe the digital world is going to be like the offline world. Maybe it should be like the offline world in that if an artist says, you know what, I'm going to create 
a hundred copies of this song and only, and instead of saying, and everyone can listen to it, but only a hundred people get the price appreciation. What we would say is only a hundred people could listen to it or only the hundred people who own it at that point in time. And I guess you could look at it and say, well, it's a little like the Wu-Tang Clan, whenever they created their last album and said, only one person can have this. And it sold for about four million. I didn't million. see that, really. Oh, you had see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was no. a Wu-Tang, their last, uh, their last album. So they created one version of it. And only one person owns it. There's, It can't be shared more broadly until a certain date, which is quite incredible. So in a way, what we've done is we've created a way for artists to create limited editions that they say to their fans, there's only 50 or only 100 of you can actually listen to this. And so what we've actually done is create something in music that has never really existed before, has not really existed much before, which is scarcity. Mm. And that becomes really, really powerful. But music has been devalued for the last 20 years, whereas people are, oh, music's free. Like me, it's just everywhere... Right. I can get it for free. Now what we can do is we can say, no, musicians can create, they can create singles and albums that have music. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be stolen. It doesn't mean that somebody can't record the audio file and, and put it on SoundCloud. But it does mean that only 50 or 100 people who own it can get the original experience of how the artist wanted it to be heard in the format they wanted to hear. So that was kind of our idea around 2021 as we started exploring this, and we actually were working with artists at the time. A lot of these artists were like, hey, I want to do an NFT project. And then they dug into it and they're like, huh, I have to hire a graphic artist. And it's <laughs> like, I just put my music on it. This doesn't feel that special. And we were like, yeah, I think you're right. Why don't we create a format that is unique to only the owners of it actually get to experience it the way you wanted it to be? Yeah, and I think that like you kind of have to reframe music in your mind because mm -hmm. unfortunately the advent of the MP3 and yeah. streaming services have really changed fans' relationship mm -hmm. to musicians in the That's past, right. in the past few decades. Mm -hmm. You go back to CDs, really. Before this, I was chatting to one of my team members and we were prepping for the show and we were talking about how we really did enjoy buying CDs mm -hmm. because there was something about supporting the artist. And so I think what you're talking about with music is it's very easy for a lot of people to, to listen to this and say, well, but so what? Like, I don't need scarcity. I only mm. want to hear that song once or a few times. Right. But you need to think about like your favorite artists. Right. You want to support them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's the part we lost. This is what I, I feel like I'm stealing your line here. No, I'm calling no. this the 10 billion problem in the music right. industry. Yeah. The $10 billion problem. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I understand this is that in the last 20 years, recorded music sales have dropped 45% and there's been right. $10 billion in lost revenue mm -hmm. because of streaming and the right. change in the business model. Mm -hmm. So we used to, more money used to go to the artists because we would buy their recorded yeah. music in the form. That's right. CDs. And so now we don't do that. Mm -hmm. And that's a massive opportunity because mm -hmm. the super fans still yeah. want to support. Yeah. And, and that, and the interesting thing with that analysis is that it's sort of raw numbers. Music industry 20 years ago, so 2001, at the peak of the CD era, it was about a $24 billion industry. This is recorded music in North America, similar size to the video game industry. Yeah. I love this. Today, industry. music is. 40%, I think it's like 15 billion. Video game industry is five times bigger. It's actually over a hundred billion dollars. Uh, so even to say it's a $10 billion issue or, or gap is a massive understatement. Mm -hmm. It's like music is even more prevalent today. The amount of music being consumed is way up. The amount of music it being used to sell products or to sell iPhones or to move other products, to sell Amazon products, it is mm -hmm. everywhere. But the value of it has just gone down and down and down and down to each individual stream being a fraction of a fraction of a cent. And the impact of that actually hits on the artists who produce that music because their position today compared to where they were 20 years ago is dramatically worse off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is where you hear those stats from Spotify about how Spotify has like 8 million artists and the average person is only making like a couple thousand dollars a year. Right. And there's just horrible stats on- Yeah, and it so, makes it 
So cool. what if, you know, like, it's good that lots of people can become artists and the major artists, like Taylor Swift's doing okay, you know, Drake's doing okay, <laughs> BTS doing okay. The difference between today and 20 years ago is it's been so much more challenging to be a mid-tier artist. Like, the long tail never made any much money from art. Or they could maybe earn a, a career. Like, they didn't register nationally. But today, it's dramatically harder to be in that mid-tier. 20 years ago, you could have had a good career in that mid-tier. Mm. But today, you can't. So just to give you the stats on Spotify, Spotify is not an offender here. Spotify actually, in a way, saved the industry. But if for a million streams, which is quite challenging for an artist to get, you make about three and a half thousand dollars. Just to give you an idea, a band that we work with got on New Music Friday. That's a big result. And after a month, that song that got on New Music Friday had 20,000 streams. Wow. So you go, okay, so that's what one fiftieth of that. So they made less than a hundred dollars. <laughs> As one of the musicians I worked with, he said, yeah, it's less than the cost that it tossed to get the Uber with all the equipment to the event. <laughs> So do musicians just make their money off of concerts and merch now that is becoming uh, well, or, or not. a lot of musicians will lose money on their tours. So in a lot of ways, musicians are quite like startups, which is in their early years, they're loss making. They have to have another line of work because they're not making money from music and any money they do make, they have to reinvest back into it with the hope that one day they make it big and they make their money later on in their career. Like even the chain smokers, I think would said their last tour, they actually lost money on, which is just exceptional because wow. they're one of the biggest bands in the world. It is quite exceptional. Do extent of the music industry, you do hear a lot of people talking about merch, which I actually think is it's not funny, but it's kind of like in the tech industry, if somebody had a significant revenue line from their t-shirts, <laughs> I'd be like, ooh, I don't think that business <laughs> model's working, right? Like, I, I, and and this is the industry we're in, like. There's something wrong here yeah. you know, that we actually are making money from t-shirts. We're not making money from recorded music. We're losing money from live. We can't be making it up on the t-shirts. And I guess for us, like we are saying something that is goes against the grain in the music industry, which is before everyone's like, put it on the DSPs, put it on Spotify. We're actually saying, don't put everything on Spotify. Only your top fans will appreciate some of your music, right? There's some of your music that is not going to you know, get you a billion streams. Even if you're Miley Cyrus. So Miley Cyrus released Flowers in January. Absolutely gangbuster song. It's now over a billion streams. In when she dropped the album, she had a demo. It's called the demo version of it. That song has got 10 million streams. So that made her about $35,000. So just think about that. That is a song that only probably really appeals to her top fans. If she instead had kept that rare and said you know what the only people are going to hear this is my top fans i'm going to put it in a special album it's going to be priced 25 dollars, and at this song is only going to appear in that album at 30 dollars. she would have, would she have sold ten thousand easily right so mm -hmm. that's what her point is that there is music that is you're only selling to your top fans but they will pay dramatically more than what they would pay on a dsp which is effectively nothing very, very interesting. Let's use this as a jumping off point into Vault. So yeah. we're talking around Vault mm -hmm. without specifically talking yeah. about it. Yes, yeah, sure. So mm -hmm. tell us about Vault. Give us the sort yeah. of the, the high so, level elevator pitch. Yeah. So basically Vault is a new digital format that uses crypto that allows us an artist to create a limited edition version of a single EP or album. It supports multimedia, so it also supports voice memos, video, pictures, and it basically creates that limited edition, which they can then sell directly to their fans. And within that limited edition, give me a little bit of idea of, without getting too technical, mm -hmm. yeah. explain the tech stack to us. Sure. Yeah. So a couple of things that we designed from the very start, we said to ourselves, we said, number one, this is a mobile experience. This is not going to be a web experience. Certainly, the last time I listened to music on the web was MySpace. You know, so music is dom you know, dominantly listened to on the phone. So we said, we have to build this natively for mobile. It has to be a mobile experience. Number two, we have to build this because 99% of the audience are not into crypto. They want the experience. They're not going to learn about wallets. We have to build it so they can build it with their credit. They can buy with their credit card. So that's a core part of it. And number three, as we said earlier, exclusivity. You don't buy it, you don't get to listen to it. That has to be a core benefit that in effect, our artists are saying to their fans, I have a magic box 
and you know, this is an artist you love. And I have put content in it that only 50 or 100 or 1,000, depending on how big the artist is, are going to see. All you have to do is get your credit card out and pay $5 to see what's in that box. That's what we've created. In terms of the underlying technology, the way we do this is when a user creates an account with us, we provision a wallet for them. So and that's connected to like their email address. We then, when they purchase a vault, that's in effect an NFT and it's minted on Solana and the Metaplex format. And we take that NFT, we mint it, we put it into that wallet. That wallet, or sorry, that NFT acts as a key to unlock the media. The media itself is stored in Arweave in an encrypted mm -hmm. format. So Arweave's decentralized storage. So it's there permanently. And the idea there is that they own this. So if you buy this music, you shouldn't have to worry with Vault goes away. Vault goes away, you still have access to your music. So what happens is the NFT acts as the key. It works with the Vault protocol, which grabs the media of Arweave, decrypts it, downloads it to the user device. And so then they can enjoy their music. What the user sees is they put a credit card in, they buy it, the music downloads, they play it, they're happy. Where does the user listen to the music? Oh, in the app. So we have mm -hmm. native iOS and Android apps. Okay. Okay. And you said there's other multimedia that can be sort of... Yeah. Maybe it's not only a song, yeah, maybe it's so a we, copy of the set list, or I don't know. Yeah, so we the support, there, as long as it's digital media, we can support it. But the main digital media we support are audio files. Now, that's not just music. It could be voice. Mm -hmm. Voice memos is very popular. Uh, we have a lot of artists who, you know, whenever they're creating a song, this is the original memo where they came up with the melody. We have those, right? If you love a song, oh, imagine cool. hearing the first, you know, the first time they came up with the melody or some of the lyrics. So we put that in. Uh, handwritten lyrics when they wrote the song and X this out and then they wrote it and doodled on it. So they can create a picture of that. Uh, behind the scenes video uh, we can put in there. And also some of our artists have put in the stems. Mm -hmm. So the actual individual, the vocals, the drums, you can play those individually. And then lastly, and it's a really nice thing that's come back, which was really big for vinyl and to some extent CD, which was the lighter notes, like who produced it, who mixed it, all of the sort of background that if you're a real music fan that you really get into, oh, this guy's a great writer. I love what he did here on this, you know, so that some of them wrap it up with the liner notes. It makes so much sense. I get so fired up about this is such a great example of you're building a business that is using blockchain to yeah. create a better experience for both artists and the <laughs> fans. Yeah. And it's not about speculation at all. Sure. I'm not trying to buy this piece of like this song or this album or yeah. this live performance so that I can go flip it and <laughs> sell it to somebody yeah. else. I'm buying it because I... Yeah, I love this artist and I want to have this content. Right? Yeah. You were saying before we recorded that currently, could I resell? It's actually, you know, as part of what you mentioned before, we've actually focused so much on the collecting and playing experience that we've not enabled resell yet. We yeah. will do. Uh -huh. We're going to do it later this year. But we want people to come in and buy it because they want that music, not because they think it's going to become more valuable. Now, yeah. some of the stuff will. Like, I'm almost certain it will. Sure. Like, we have some artists coming on board like with an artist in New York called The Cave, and his stuff is amazing. And he's done two drops. They've sold out really quickly. I'm very confident he is going to be a major success. And when he does, like, sure, would you like to see one of only 50 of his first ever single of that song in this format? Of course you would. But at the moment, we really want to focus on the collecting and playback experience. And that later on, we're going to introduce resell. I think that's so smart. I actually think that's, that's a model that more builders in Web3 should be thinking about mm -hmm. that model. Don't get me wrong. I think we, we value the decentralization of Web3, you and yeah. both. It's so important. We value the true ability of ownership, which would mm -hmm. mean that you should be able to resell it or trade it yeah. or give it to somebody else, all of yeah. that. But the initial reason should be based upon some form of utility and right. if you remove the ability to resell it then it forces that yeah. utility it forces us to get good at delivering on a yeah. core user benefit that people yeah. are buying it for the right reason which ensures product market fit right, right. so yes. that's right it's very very interesting you've mentioned a few the cave uh, you talked mm -hmm. about the Miley Cyrus example. I yeah. I'm sure Miley Cyrus yeah. hasn't done a vault yet, but hopefully yeah. she does someday. Can you give us any other examples of what artists have done and what the results have been, particularly on the dollars and cents? I'd be curious to know. Yeah. 
how much these artists are making. Because I know one thing I always think about is on sound, uh, sound XYZ, which we've talked about a bunch on mm-hmm. the show. I love that at the top of their site, they show how much money has gone to artists. To artists, yeah. Such a core mission of what they're building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we've worked with about 30 artists right now. The interesting ones are more when you compare to their streaming revenue. So a few examples there. A really good one is a Canadian singer-songwriter called Jordan Hart. His last album, he did about 2 million streams over the last 12 months. So it's about $7,000. He, for his next album, he actually ate songs that he was working on them. And he said, I'm not sure Ollie's going to make the album. I'm going to turn it into an EP and I'm going to drop it exclusively on Vault. He sold that out in 24 hours and he made $1,500 from those songs before he even released his album. He's got to do two more drops. And so our ambition, and what we realized is we could have upsized it a lot more. Our ambition is for him to make more money from his new album than he did from his old one before he drops the album. Right. (laughs) So that's kind of where we're at, where we actually, we don't expect to replace streaming. There will always be a place for streaming. 90% or 95% of music should be on streaming. Artists want that reach. You want the ubiquity. Like everybody wants to be Miley Cyrus. You want to have a billion streams. And your path to getting there, and even Miley Cyrus, like I see a great example of this is Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is a master at selling physical product because physical product today is the only place where she can actually, well, there's two things you can do. One is you can actually generate a lot of money up front. And number two, she can influence charting because a physical sale is worth a hundred times a, a stream. Mm-hmm. So when she re-released Midnight with three extra songs, suddenly she's back at the charts again because people are buying that physical album. So when you say a physical sale, do you mean like a CD or a vinyl? Vinyl and CD, yeah. She's incredible. So here we have the most innovative artist, one of the most innovative artists today in terms from a business perspective, and she's shifting physical. And why is that? Why are we using a format that is 70 years old, which is impractical, yeah, immovable, doesn't play in the device that everybody has music on? Half the people who buy vinyl don't own a record player. <laughs> well, because people want a connection with the artist, right? And so, like, she is demonstrating there is a need for a format mm. that can give people ownership. But what if they could not only have ownership, they could also play it on their phone? And that's kind of what we're trying to get to. So basically, Vault would replace the vinyls that Taylor Swift. I think it would complement it. So vinyl is like a billion dollar industry. I Mm -hmm. still think that people want it on their walls. It looks really pretty. And I include myself in it. Most people who buy vinyl don't play it (laughs) that much. But I know that half the people don't play it because half of them don't have record players. Which is wild. It's a collectible, right? And, you know, the interesting thing is... and. I love exploring that because you'd say, well, in fact, a friend of mine who works in the record industry, and he said they accidentally printed the wrong vinyl record and they sent it out to a thousand like super fans, right? And he said they had an absolute heart attack and they're like, oh my God, we have to email everybody. And he was working with them and he said, let's just wait and see what happens. And he said, after two weeks, they got three emails. (laughs) These are super (laughs) fans. Nobody listened to it. So that was the thing. But... I think the point here is that people want the connection with the artist. They want to support the artist. They want to own something. And it's important that the music is in there, even if they're not using that format. And so I just think that's really interesting. And so we see that as well when we're selling faults. We've surveyed people. And it's interesting. The three reasons why they buy. Number one, and you have to have one, is I love this artist, right? So when people say to me, oh, well, I wouldn't buy this. And I'm like, okay, what artist do you really love? And if they don't love an artist, I'm like, well, you're you're not a customer anyhow. Okay, but (laughs) they all have an artist that they love. And I'm like, okay, you love this artist. Okay, number two. The number two reason is they want to hear that music, right? That's why I think it's important that this music is exclusive because it has to be something that it's a magic box. I don't get to see what's in it unless I buy it. And number three is important, but it's still number three is I want to support that artist. And so that's the sort of package that, what we're trying to create, which is, I love this artist, I want to hear this music, and I want to support them. Can you give us a mental model or some way to think about where music is going and how the different players fit in? We've talked about sound. We've talked about Audius previously on this show. 
Uh, we've talked about Royal. I almost don't even know if we want to go into, we've talked about Ticketmaster mm -hmm. and what Avenged Sevenfold is doing. And yes. You give yeah. us the idea I'll, I'll of how our, frame all this. Yeah, our mental model. And I think they're all interesting, right? And I think they're all interesting applications of Web3. Royal is interesting for a more developed artist. It's actually just one of many options for an artist to monetize their income stream. Royal's not very good if you're a small or emerging artist. Right, you, you can't monetize community. You need a big yeah. community. You need a re recurring revenue stream. And so you could go to Royal and you could monetize part of it that way. You could go to a company called Beatbread, which will give you money as an advance. You could go to a record label and take an advance. And there's a number of others. You could also sell off your catalog or a portion of your catalog. So it is one of many options. I think it's an interesting one. I think the thing for me that is unproven with Royal is, is it a consumer product or is it a financial product. By that, I mean, who buys it? Do they buy it and put a premium on it because they're a super fan and therefore they like to own that? Mm -hmm. Or are they buying it because it gives it like an, that 8% return on capital, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know. I don't know. I think they're doing a really nice job and it's a nice product. But that's where I think it sort of sits in my head. Audius to me sits much more like a, with a SoundCloud space. Mm -hmm. SoundCloud has been a, not a very successful business, but it has been very successful for a lot of artists in terms of getting awareness. It's not one I go to a lot in SoundCloud because it doesn't sort of fit with my own sort of personal consumption of music. And so I don't really know it as well as the other ones. And then the third one, which is Sound XYZ. So Sound XYZ, I think best execution of music NFTs that I think is out there. Mm -hmm. I think they've done an amazing job at, at building a community. I think they've done an amazing job at creating sort of user benefit of holding a kind of non-exclusive asset and that mm -hmm. anyone can listen to that. I, I listen, yeah. I actually, I use their app and I like it and I like to play I, it. Yeah. It's, but it's weird to me that my playlist of music that I don't own, that to me just feels a little weird. It's like, why did I buy it? And so. I would say that, well, I'll say how we view them and how we think the world is different. So our fundamental different worldview is, I think they think that a music NFT should be freely listenable and music should be available for free. Our view is that some music, and maybe these worlds coexist, certainly some music should not be. It should actually be restricted. It should be exclusive to the people who purchased it. And, you know, maybe it's the case that 95% of music is in sort of sits in their world and 5% sits in our world. Certainly we feel, we understand our user behavior and we don't feel, uh, we went back to this on product market fit. We know our users aren't buying it because they think it's going to appreciate value because right now they can't even sell it. Mm -hmm. And that is would be my main concern with sound, which is how much of it is price speculation. It seems to be very baked into their product and all of the marketing around it is all about how music nfts are going to be the future and you should buy it now and i'm like that makes me feel very uncomfortable because mm -hmm. i'm not sure I don't, I don't really think i want music to be a speculative asset and i don't want what i don't want is when there's bear markets like we're in the moment for artists to like not be able to operate right like i want them to be able to people to buy it because they love the content, not buying it because, oh, well, it's a bear market and nothing's going up in value. So I'm not buying it. So that's our, so sound is probably our closest rival of those three. Mm -hmm. That's fair. But we have a very diff different view of the world, I would say. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I think mm -hmm. you definitely do. To me, honestly, when I think about sound and Audius, the most interesting use case to me there is the curator economy mm -hmm. and the way that they are focused on building out a way that if you make the biggest playlist, then yeah. you get token reward. Right. And yes. That that makes total sense to me. Like yeah. the curator economy cannot exist without blockchain. Yeah. With blockchain all of a sudden it can exist. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's go do that. Whoever is, has built the biggest playlist on Spotify, they deserve some credit yeah. for that. And yeah. competition yeah. coming their way. For sure. Yeah. And both of those companies have done uh, even though we have philosophical differences so we say i actually have a huge respect for both companies and and i think they've done things there which i think are really revolutionary and are things that we look at and go that's really cool i think you're right there i do think that you're correct that you have a different view which is to offer a utility-based 
product, which is <laughs> access. Access is probably one of the best words that I continually <laughs> use when I'm trying to describe yeah. NFTs, right? Is it is an ability to give access directly peer to peer from an artist, from a creator to a fan that you mm-hmm. would not be able to give them with another file type, right? right. The only, yes. Like in the current web two way of doing that, I would either have to mail you a physical like file type mm-hmm. of, of a CD or something like mm-hmm. that. Or I'd have to put it on behind some web to login where you log in with your mm-hmm. email, but then it's super easy to share and you don't have ownership. And so yeah. there's a loss there. I'm curious, you are building a protocol and a consumer app That's at right. the same time. How do you see mm-hmm. see that long term? What's yeah. the vision and the goal? Yeah, absolutely. And that's how we spent, uh, certainly we talked to investors, uh, we spent a lot of time on that. So there's really two things. There's Vault, the player, and then there's mm-hmm. Vault, the format. And the difference is that what our aspiration is, is that other people built other players. And in fact, DS, it's a DSP is so a digital service provider, that's like Spotify, Tidal, Deezer, SoundCloud. Our aspiration is that they start to support this format type. And why would Deezer or Tidal do it? Well, they want to support our artists. They want to differentiate mm-hmm. from Spotify. What if they could say to their artists, you could create a premium version and sell it. And the reason your fans will buy it is because they will own it. Why would Deezer do it? So, well, they'll make more money doing that and they'll differentiate from Spotify. So our vision, success to us, our sort of five, 10-year goal is whenever all of the DSPs all the way up to Spotify support this format, you can buy it on any one of them and play it on any one of them. And in that future, Vault probably as a player probably fails because mm-hmm. you know we're not competing with Spotify. Like we just can't compete with Spotify. But that's kind of the world we want. We want Vault to become an industry standard in the same way that CD became an industry standard. CD was invented by Sony, but Sony realized that they couldn't make it proprietary. They couldn't say you know only Sony artists can record this CD and only Sony can make this player. It's actually it's quite revolutionary when you think about it in retrospect. They actually invented the technology and pretty much open source and said, you know what? Mm-hmm. Anyone can record this format and anyone can make a player and we'll make it, you know, a small royalty in everyone that's created. That's actually the model for what we're trying to do, which is to create a format that every artist, every label and every DSP can use. And in effect, what we care about is that format and, and the sort of the, the protocol behind it. So what is the business model? So the business model is, well, today what happens is we have like DSPs typically take a 30% cut. That's the same with us. But where we think about it is 25% goes to the retailer, which is us vault the application. 5% goes to the protocol. When other players spin up and start selling in the vault format, they will get 25% and that protocol will get 5%. And that will go back to the treasury of the token holders. Is there a token? Uh, There isn't yet, but there will be. Interesting. I won't go down that path. That's a whole other tokenomics. And I'd love to dive into that. Well, it's it's a simple sort of business model. And and actually, again, a a real world analogy is with Sony, they, when they open source this format, as it were, they then created like a kind of a council of other companies or stakeholders who had an interest in that format. We want to do that again, but in a Web3 format where Universal should have a stake in this, Sony should have a stake in this, Spotify should have a stake. Anyone who uses this format should have a stake in how this format Mm -hmm. evolves. And so we would expect them all to be token holders. Which is really the the whole mantra and vision of Web3 is Mm -hmm. decentralized governance. That's right. Yeah. You can do that with a token. Yeah. And it would be amazing to be able to get, you would welcome input. From those oh yeah, absolutely. Companies. We would, you know, and I think the the finance is to try and like, how do they gain it, and at what proportion do they get it? Do they get it relative yeah. to their usage of the protocol? That's the tokenomics, tokenomics nearly, yeah. as it were. But that's down the line. Fascinating. Okay, I want to show Colt mm-hmm. a little bit for those who want yeah. to go and check this out. Actually, you know what? Let me before we show. I do have a question here. Is the user acquisition for you directly from the artists? Is that where most of the users are coming from? Uh, it's a mix. So we now have a, a reasonable install base of people who collect these. We also have quite deliberately focused on some genres. So for example, the New York indie rock scene is somewhere that we, if you actually look about half of our vaults on the platform are from there. So when we drop a new one, 
you know, we can actually say, hey, you liked telescreens. Well, you're probably going to like Sid Simons or you're going to like Bo or you're going to like Sun Sun. This is kind of similar, similar genre. The other half, probably more than half, actually comes from the artist. And if you think about the artist, what else do they have to sell? Like the merch line? Like they can tell them to go to spot <laughs> yeah, t shirts, or they can tell them to go to Spotify and stream and they make no point no 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 you know, three sets per stream. So for them, they actually now have something they can say to their fans, Hey guys, I'm dropping my album on Vault. There's only fifty of them, there's only a hundred of them, go buy it. A lot of the users come in that way. And when they do come in, there's no talk about web three, there's no talk about NFTs. It's just, hey, you wanna Buy this. What, yeah. What's the range of price typically for? Yeah, so at the very low end for a single, the, the deluxe single is four ninety nine, and then for an album, it's twenty five to thirty. And does the artist decide the price? Or do you uh, we work with the artist to set. We advise them on price and scarcity. Right. Yeah. It's so interesting when we're so early. There's so much more, and I'm sure it's a great thing as an entrepreneur. It's actually beneficial if you get to work very closely with your users in the beginning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it also it's a scale challenge, right? Yeah. Is it's this you're in that gradual and then quickly, right? Like you, yeah, you're well, still what in that gradual phase? Yeah, what we find is we very deliberately have chosen to work with emerging artists. So we've one or two major ones. So Fletcher was a big one launched with us last year. But the great thing about emerging artists is we can work very closely with them. We can also make mistakes. And we've made mm -hmm. mistakes where we like, like a very simple one. We thought the best time to launch is when they're launching a single on DSPs, on Spotify. Mm -hmm. But what we found is that they were drowned out because on that day, they're promoting on Spotify. And so invariably, we now either launch like a month before or a month after. Month before, unreleased, pre-released. Mm -hmm. Month after, deluxe edition. So... Mm -hmm. You have to give them like different windows. And I want to learn that with a small artist you've never heard of. I don't want to learn that with Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, there is a lot of understanding within the Web3. So for the hobbyists, the mechanics of us who are here, there's a lot of understanding of this is new tech or so yeah. early. The number of examples you could pick out. Most recently, Nike dropping their Our Force One collection. They had to push back Mint a week. And then when yeah. they actually did Mint, they had a bunch of tech issues and they had to yeah. sit down for a few hours and then they yeah. had Twitter space to explain it. So there is, I think, an understanding within. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that's within the Web3 space. What, You're not focused yeah. on that. You're focused 90, on the mainstream. Yeah, 95% of our artists, they don't know, like they've heard of NFTs. Often they have a somewhat negative view on them. Right. And we've had to sort of strip that away. And we say, look, understand that this is a vehicle, this is a format, and they fall in love with that. And some of them are like, okay, I get the underlying technology and I think that's cool. A lot of them just don't really care. It's like, it's not, mm -hmm. they understand that they understand it enough that they are like, okay, I get it, but they're not that interested in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to ask this, but I need to, I've got to ask about what Avenge Sevenfold is doing and with mm -hmm. like this idea of membership for your mm -hmm. fans yeah, and then also NFT ticketing, just yeah. because we're talking, I'm just curious, sure. do you guys think about? So it's actually one thing that Vault set out not to be, which is a club. Uh, we're not a music club. Music clubs have had a pretty mixed history. There's only some artists that are good at it. And I'd say one of the things that I find very dispiriting coming into music and something we wanted to change was to some extent, I think people have devalued the music. They sort of said, well, you know, the music is kind of free and we're going to upsell them to insert this, uh, the community being one. Mm -hmm. And I think that's bullshit. Imagine saying about a master, you know, like uh, this Leonardo da Vinci or this Picasso, that art is free. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but you get to be part of a club, right? You would never do that. And I think it's weird that we treat music like that. And not even that, like if you had, you know, when people graduate out of art school, like they have exhibitions, you don't sort of say, oh, this stuff should be free. Like these are, these guys are college students. They actually mm -hmm. say, no, this person's an artist. We're going to value it. We're going to put on a show. Like some of them go for thousands of dollars. And I, we actually find it when we were out fundraising that some VCs are still in the world that like, oh, music should be free. And I'm like, I can understand as a consumer why you think that, but why do you think artists should accept that? So to some extent, and when we work with artists and they, to some extent, I think, 
I don't know if it's lack of confidence or how you've been trained. Is there like, what else can I stuff in there? Should we do a discount on the merch? Should we give like free event tickets? And we're like, your music is brilliant. Like your music is right. fantastic. Don't devalue what you do. Don't stuff it with all of this other stuff that you, I think users don't care about. In fact, there was research recently, I think with Media did it, and they asked people what they wanted, what they would pay an extra $5 a month. And they had a whole range of them. At the very top was unreleased music, right? At the very bottom was AMA with the artist, <laughs> right? Like, I just thought it was amazing. Like, they were like, you yeah. know what? And I was like, you know, that's great. Fans actually... They want the music. They value it. The AMA with the artist is something that could happen on you know, Instagram. Like That's not valuable. So that's kind of our viewpoint. So we're... No, that's not to say some artists are really good at doing fan clubs. There's a, a, I'll give them a shout out. There's an artist called Silver Cup in New York. Great band. They have a very active Discord server and they have done an amazing job. There are exceptions like that and that's brilliant. We've designed Vault to be kind of agnostic to whether you're that type of artist or, or not. You can use it, but I'm, for most artists, I don't see it. I don't see Miley Cyrus running a Discord server. Most indie artists I know struggle to update their Instagram when they say they will. I just don't see they're running, running a community. They're totally blood. Yeah. I don't want to be in it. I love their music, but I'm like, do I really want to hang out all my days in the Discord server full of other people who like 80s? punk bands no but maybe i'm not the right demo but to me the main use case that i get really excited about is two actually one access to live shows <laughs> it is ridiculous that if you are a major fan of an artist mm -hmm. you also have yeah. to compete with like thousands of bars oh right yeah i think bond. that's everything you look at t swift's so crazy yeah. what happened with yeah her concert tickets are going for like Ten twenty thousand yeah. dollars yeah. in the secondary, and she gets zero of that. So yeah. that access for for super fan, yeah. and then some but form that's, of royalty. That's actually, like to me, that seems to be more of a Web two problem. Like Spotify and Apple Music know exactly who the top Taylor Swift fans are. Why can't they figure out a way to ensure that they get those tickets? Like this isn't a difficult problem. So like I, I there are obviously market dynamics, but I don't think it needs Web three. I think Web three <laughs> could help but I'm not sure it needs Web3. Your other point on Web3 or NFT ticketing, I think it's, again, it's really interesting. I would say with that one is be careful what you wish for. You know, understand that NFTs allow the primary issuer to control the asset that you think you own, which is not true to the same extent with physical assets. So in the US, as an example, obviously there's similar laws in other countries. There's this thing called right of first sale, which is, if I buy this phone, right, it's an Apple phone, Apple can't say that I can only get it repaired in an Apple store or I can only resell it through their approved channels, right? They cannot say that because I've bought it, I own it, I have the right to do what the hell I like with it. Understand that with NFTs, these primary vendors, which are Ticketmaster primarily, that's what they are getting the ability to, which is to control what you can do with a product that you thought you owned. So... My big fear with NFT ticketing is you actually people lose the rights they had before because that primary vendor who isn't necessarily looking out for our best interests is actually exerting more control that they didn't have in the sort of pre-Web3 world. I'm confused actually now yeah, yeah. by this. Because to me, if the ticket was an NFT, mm -hmm. then I should have, and I'm the buyer of that ticket, yeah. I should have a much easier time selling it no no i'm selling saying that you actually it. potentially have a less easy time really because yes because with a physical ticket it's about the law the law is there's a right of first yeah. sale that you can actually go and sell it on StubHub. the primary vendors which is Ticketmaster master live nation i've hated that and i've fought it in court and i've tried to restrict it in every possible way they can over the last 20 years stubhub has been taken to court numerous times over them allowing for resale like resale that's why scalpers is like that's a special issue but remember when they talk about scalpers they also mean you what they're saying is right you shouldn't be allowed the right or your right should be really constrained about what you can do so what they're saying is well if you bought that taylor swift ticket you don't own it it's just a license from us and if you want to resell it, well, you can do it through the approved channel. And that approved channel takes 30% and it does this and it does that. 
So hmm. that's my concern. I actually think NFT tickets could lead us to a less good world that we are in today. Wow. And is that because this law does not apply to NFTs? Well, we, that's what we'll have to see, right? Like, is a ticket an asset or a license? So, for example, an MP3, when you buy an MP3, it's hard to buy them now, but when you did, it was a license. It wasn't an asset. You couldn't sell it. You couldn't leave it in your will. Not many people did, I'm sure. But it wasn't an asset that you owned. The question is going to be, is that NFT ticket an asset that you own, or is it a sort of license in which the primary vendor can actually describe you know, under what grounds you can use this thing that you think you own, but you don't really. Right. And is that why Ticketmaster is building on like centralized blockchains like Flow? Could well be. <laughs> right. Because if, if they did build, if they built on a decentralized blockchain, like well, Ethereum, like then they, they would be yeah, like to do this. Yes. It's rare for these very large, powerful organizations to build things for the benefit of consumers where they don't have, you know, it doesn't increase their control. And so ticketing is probably the one area where I've been sort of least excited about hmm. it within music because I actually think the situation where you today, where you actually own an asset, those rights could be eroded through yeah. NFTs. Wow. That is it. Very very hot take, Nigel. You're the first person <laughs> that ever has been bearish on NFT ticketing. I feel like that's one of like the use cases that gets discussed the most. Right. Well, it could be. It could be great for Ticketmaster. You know, well, it sounds and, like and, it all and, depends on what happens and whether it gets considered an asset or a license. Right. Well, like, it, think about it in the same way as we actually look at these debates about royalties within the NFT world. Like here, we think blur open sea are bad because they're not enforcing these royalties think about it in that instance the creator that's their artist they're somebody we perceive as a good person and therefore they do deserve this money but in the ticketing world that creator is Ticketmaster, mm -hmm. right and now open sea and blur are saying well we're not so in this open world we don't have to we didn't have to enforce a royalty it was just a you know we did it because that was what was considered the right thing to do so it's a question of what do we think of the originator of this asset, as it were, and do we truly own that asset? Okay. I'm going to stop us there because no I could keep going here. Tell us about New Music Tuesday and how yes. somebody can grab the next vault drop. Yeah. So one of the things we launched a few weeks ago, we developed this new concept or new format, and we realized that you know we can't just expect people to come and buy it. They want to actually experience it. And so every Tuesday, we launch a new artist on the platform where we do a free drop and anyone over 24 hours can come in. It's nearly always a single, but it's a, you know, it's a full single and they can get it for free. Uh, in fact, they can get two copies and we're going to start to introduce the idea that you meant to and gift one so you mm. can get your friends involved. We get a great lineup of artists coming over the next month. So every Tuesday, starting at midday Eastern, it runs for 24 hours because we've got a global membership base. Can come in and grab one. Awesome. We'll link in the show notes to oh, where great. you can Thank find you. this week's drop. And is that open edition or is there? And it's we capped it, but we didn't think we would hit our cap. We it was like we've just started it. We hit our cap on Tuesday of 500. We'll probably up it next week. The idea is not to hit the cap, but sometimes we do. <laughs> what a, what a good problem to have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else you want to share? Floor is yours for a show where people can find Vault. Well, yeah, give so, links in the show notes yeah. where you can follow you. Vault is vault.fan. It's Vault Music on the app at Play Store. If you want to follow me, I'm Nigel Eccles on Twitter. Awesome. Yeah, we'll put the links in the show notes. Okay, a couple of speed round questions before yep. we wrap up. First one, favorite person to follow on Twitter? Oh, yes. Oh, this is the easy one. So it's Kobe. But maybe the 2022 Kobe, where you actually posted a lot. You know, I was actually went back as I was thinking about this. Who was a favorite person to follow? And, you know, Kobe, if you're out there, come back. The bear market needs you. You know, it's weird to have somebody who just, well, he has his own interest. Like, I think he just finds it really funny. And he actually is very funny himself and just brings like humor and levity to the whole situation. So I think we need to see more of him back. But it makes me think about, well, I was talking to Zeneca, another founder in the space mm -hmm. and uh, a thought leader recently, and we were both talking about our struggles with mental health because mm -hmm. of burnout. Really. Yeah. And burnout is so pervasive for founders yeah. in Web3 in this space, because not only are you a 
startup founder yeah. who has the pressure of perhaps investors and product mm-hmm. market fit and the team mm-hmm. and trying to build something. But you also have holders who are yelling at yeah. you about the floor price. So I, I don't know. I find it interesting. I wonder, I don't, I don't know Kobe, but I wonder if he needed a break and if he did, it's break for him. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Definitely take it. Favorite must read book that you recommend the most? Oh, the one that I read recently and I kind of couldn't believe I hadn't read it before was uh, High Fidelity. So I've rediscovered that Nick Hardby is, I think, the greatest writer alive. But I, getting into the music industry in the last couple of years, it was like the one book was like, well, I have to read that. Now I'm reading everything he's writing, at the, uh, he's written. But that's a, an amazing book. Awesome. Okay, last question. If you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, mm-hmm. what would you write on it? I would say it would be, it would probably be some of the lines as like, music is valuable, right? Music and musicians are valuable. And uh, they're probably just that. But, you know, like the sub sub headline is like, we, we need to show it, right? Like we need to give them formats that they can showcase their art. And we as consumers need to value it. And because if we don't keep paying for it, they won't, they'll stop making it. <laughs> and to me, that would be a terrible world to live in. So that would be my billboard. A great reminder. And I think something that we started off this episode talking about this $10 billion problem. And I think a lot of people have a tough time grasping really why it matters. And Mm -hmm. there's why it matters. It matters because we will lose musicians and music makes the world a better place. It makes our lives better. It gives us an outlet. It gives us culture. It gives us so much that we don't even necessarily recognize. And so, yeah, we really need to respect that. Nigel, this has been an awesome time. Thanks so much for coming on and hanging out with us today. Really appreciate everything you're doing. And yeah, look forward to staying in touch. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for listening in, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.